This is the second video in our cost accounting series on capital investment models. And in this video, we're going to be talking about the accounting rate of return or the accrual accounting rate of return. So let's first define the accounting rate of return, or again, the accrual accounting rate of return. So you may see it as the ARR, or you may see it as the AARR. It's the measure of profitability that measures the effect of an investment on a company's accrual based income, not the net cash inflows. And we're going to have a, a formula here, of course, for this, for this um, model. But with the accounting rate of return, we're going to have one model or one formula, but there are many different forms of the formula. So we're going to introduce all of those to you now. So the first form of our formula is to take the average annual operating income from the asset and divide that by the initial investment. So that what this is actually calculating is the average rate of return over the asset's entire life. Now this again is one form of the accounting rate of return. Now notice we're dividing by the initial investment. The accounting rate of return uses the initial investment as the denominator for all three of these forms I'm about to show you. So the next form looks like this. So there's another way we can calculate the numerator in form one, which is the average annual operating income from the asset. We can take the average annual net cash inflow and subtract the annual depreciation expense. Now again, this is just another form of the same equation. So it just depends on what you're given in a exercise or a problem, depending on what form you use. The third form, again, we're changing the numerator. We can actually take the total net cash inflows from the asset, subtract total depreciation on the asset, and get that sum, divide by the useful life. All of that is the numerator. So keep that in mind. All of this information here is the numerator, and you still need to divide that by the initial investment. Now, before we move on and look at an example, I want to talk just briefly about this number right here. Total depreciation on the assets. So let's think about that. Total depreciation. So if we depreciate an asset, the total depreciation will actually end up being the cost of the asset, unless there's residual value. If there is residual value, remember we don't depreciate an asset below its residual value. So the total depreciation on an asset will be its cost minus residual value, if there is any residual value. If it doesn't make mention of a residual value in the exercise or problem you're working on, that probably means there's zero residual value and the total depreciation will equal the cost of the asset. So before we move on to some examples of the accounting rate of return, there is an alternative method for calculating the accounting rate of return. The first method that I introduced to you produces a low accounting rate of return for two reasons. Number one, it uses the net initial investment as the denominator, which we saw in the formulas. And two, it uses income as the numerator, which necessitates deducting depreciation charges from the annual operating cash flows. This alternative method recognizes that the book value of the investment does decline over time. So this alternative method is going to give us a higher accounting rate of return than the original method that we introduced. However, no matter which one you use, the original or the alternative, it should still give you the same result. In other words, yes, it's a good investment or no, it's not a good investment. So let's take a look at the forms of the formula. Again, there are going to be three forms of the same formula for the alternative method, which is also called the average investment method for accounting rate of return. So the first form is to take the average annual operating income from the asset, which is the same numerator as the original form of, of uh, number one of the original form. But instead of dividing by the initial asset or the initial investment in the asset, we're going to divide by the average amount invested in the asset. Now, what this is going to give us is the book value of the asset halfway through its useful life. 
So instead of, inv in, in, instead of dividing by the entire initial investment, we're only going to divide by the book value of the asset halfway through its useful life. In other words, saying to ourselves that we know the asset's value decreases over its lifetime. So this is form number one. Now again, we're going to use the form or portions of each form that were given in an exercise or a problem. So form number two, we're going to take the average annual net cash inflow and subtract the annual depreciation expense. And then we're going to divide that by the average amount invested in the asset. Form three, the total net cash inflow from the asset minus the total depreciation on the asset divided by the useful life divided by the amount invested in the asset plus residual value and all of that divided by two. So again, that gives us the book value of the asset halfway through its useful life. So notice in, in the alternative method, the only portions that are changing from our original method is the denominator. Okay, so the numerator is staying the same in these forms, then, then the same as it was in the original forms. Only the denominator is changing in each one of these forms from the original method. So oftentimes I get the question, why are we adding residual value here in this third form? Because typically when we see residual value, we subtract it out. Um, like we did when we calculated total depreciation on the asset. Before, we subtracted out residual value. Cost minus residual value was total depreciation. So why then on this bottom section here are we adding back residual value? Again, keep in mind what we're looking for. We're looking for the book value of the asset halfway through its useful life. So let's figure out what that is by using an example. So here's an example. So equipment costs $1,000 and has a four-year useful life and a $200 residual value. We need to compute the book value of the equipment at the end of year two. At the end of year two, because it has a four-year life, that's halfway through its useful life. So the first thing we want to do is calculate its depreciation expense per year. So in doing that, we take the cost, less residual value, and divide that by the number of years we believe it will be useful, which is four in this case. That gives us depreciation expense of $200 per year. Step two, I need to figure out, well, what is it going to be, what's the book value going to be at the end of year two? Well, at the end of year two, it will have accumulated two years of depreciation. So 200 times two is $400. So the accumulated depreciation account would have a balance of $400. Therefore, equipment, which is on the books at cost, which was $1,000, less its accumulated depreciation would give me equipment net of $600. So this is the book value halfway through the asset's useful life. Well, let's see if the formula holds up here, because I want that to end up to be $6,000. So the amount invested in the asset was $1,000, plus the residual value, in this case is two hundred. dollars so that's $1,200, and I'm dividing it by 2 because technically I'm getting an average, and I have two numbers there, and that gives me $600. So that is why we have to add back the residual value. All right, so let's try a couple of examples here. So here's the first example. Engineered Products is shopping for new equipment. Managers are considering two investments. Equipment manufactured by Atlas cost $1 million and will last for five years and has no residual value. The Atlas equipment will generate annual operating income of $160,000. Equipment manufactured by Vera's cost $1.2 million and will remain useful for six years. It promises annual operating income of $240,500 and its expected residual value is $100,000. Which equipment offers the highest ARR, the accounting rate of return? So I'd like for you to push pause in your player now and go back. We're going to use the original formula, so the, the first three forms that I gave you, not the alternative method. So the original method, pick which form or portions of each form that you need to calculate the accounting rate of return for each one of these. Once you've found them and determined which one would be the better investment, come back and we'll see how you did. So it seems that we could use Form 1, the average annual operating income from the asset, divided by the initial investment to figure out the accounting rate of return. In this case, for Atlas, it would be 16%, and for Vera's, it would be 20%. 
So obviously Vera is, is the better of the two. We have a higher accounting rate of return here. But that really doesn't tell us if it's a good investment for us specifically, the company that we're looking at, because we don't know what their required rate of return is. So if the company's required rate of return on investments like this is 25%, neither one of these would be an appropriate investment for us. If our required rate of return is 18%, then Vera's would be an appropriate investment. All right, so I'd like you to take this same problem and now calculate the accounting rate of return based on the alternative method. So push pause on your player, go back to your alternative methods, the three different forms of the alternative method, pick which one you need or forms of, or pieces of each one that you might need and calculate the accounting rate of return for engineered products under the alternative method for accounting rate of return. Okay, in this instance, we could use the numerator from the first form and the denominator from the third form of the alternative methods. So in this case, you see just like we, uh, we um, determined that what would happen under the alternative method is we get a higher accounting rate of return than under the original method. So Alice gives us 32% and Vera's would give us 37%. So still, as we said before, they give the same result, meaning Vera's is the better of the two investments. And again, we would want to compare this with our company's required rate of return to determine yet still if it would be a good investment for us. Okay, let's try one more example. Here we have Mike's Hardware. They're adding a new product line that will require an investment of $1,454,000. Managers estimate that this investment will have a 10-year life and generate net cash inflows of $310,000 the first year, $280,000 the second year, and $240,000 each year thereafter for eight years. So we computed the payback period earlier for Mike's Hardware. Now we're computing the ARR for the investment. So I think we determined under the payback period that this was a good investment. So let's see if ARR tells us the same thing or if we can even determine it by the ARR with this information. So pick which form you need. We're gonna use the original form of the ARR right now. So under the original form, we have three equations. Pick which one or pieces of each one that you need to calculate the accounting rate of return under the original method. Come back and we'll take a look and see how you did. So under the original accounting rate of return method, it looks like we needed form three of our equation. And because this was um, unequal cash flows, we had to add them all up to get the total net cash inflow from the asset. Then we subtracted the total depreciation of the asset. In this case, it was the total costs because it didn't mention anything about residual value. So if it had, right here is where you would subtract the residual value. So in other words, you would have had $1,454,000 minus something. In this case, it's minus zero. So it's actually there. We just didn't put it there but minus zero or whatever the residual value is to get the total depreciation on the asset. Then we divide all of that by the useful life. In this case, it was 10 years. Then we divide that by the initial investment because we're using the original accounting rate of return. And we find that the accounting rate of return is 7.3%. Unfortunately, we can't really determine if this is a good investment or not because they don't give us the required rate of return. So for the company, we would need to compare this with the required rate of return to determine if it's a good investment. If it's higher than our required rate of return, it would be a good investment. If it's lower, then it would not be a good investment. So using this same problem, I would like for you to now use the accounting rate of return alternative method and calculate the ARR. Now keeping in mind that you're expecting the rate to be higher under the alternative method. So push pause on your player, calculate the accounting rate of return under the alternative method, and see what you come up with. So under the alternative method for accounting rate of return, it looks like we needed form three of the alternative method. And in this case, we ended up with 14.5%. So again, just like we expected, under the alternative method, the accounting rate of return is higher than it was on the, under the original method. 
So we need the amount invested in the asset as in the denominator plus residual value. And again, there was no residual value, so that's zero. We're on the average of two numbers, and zero is a number, so you still divide by two there in the denominator. And again, we end up with 14.5%. Again, we don't know if this is a good investment or not because we have to compare it with the company's required rate of return.